Forever 21's $10 club dresses, tank tops, glittery graphic tees, and ripped denim shorts have been closet staples for young women across the country for years. The name is practically synonymous with fast fashion. And Forever 21's massive stores have become common fixtures in America's shopping malls. But the retailer is in trouble. Forever 21 filed for bankruptcy in September 2019. And now it's closing hundreds of stores as its clothes become more interchangeable with cheap rather than trendy. At its peak, Forever 21 was a household name in fast fashion, bringing in more than $4 billion in annual sales. And much of that thanks to a strong business on its home turf, which was born out of the Los Angeles fashion scene. The real problem is that Forever 21 just isn't all that popular outside the U.S. It failed to localize and understand fashion taste in other countries, as it built stores too big and too fast. Forever 21's international business has been hemorrhaging cash, burning through more than $100 million annually since 2014. And it hasn't been making enough back in America to recuperate those losses. Yet, hungry for growth, Forever 21's owners, the Chang family, just kept on expanding its international footprint. Between 2005 and 2015, the company opened more than 200 stores globally. As part of its bankruptcy proceedings, Forever 21 says it plans to exit most of its international locations in Asia and Europe, closing dozens of shops globally. The company hasn't pegged an exact number on those plans, as conversations with landlords remain ongoing, and Forever 21 is still fighting for rent reductions. When it filed for bankruptcy, Forever 21 had 785 stores, and analysts argue that was far too many. Now, Forever 21 is the story of a failed global retailer that's still trying to bounce back. In 1981, 22-year-olds Jin Suk and Do Wan Cheng touched down in LA from South Korea. In 1984, the couple opened a 900-square-foot store called Fashion 21 in Los Angeles. It sold $700,000 worth of merchandise in its first year in business. In 1987, the family renamed the business to Forever 21. And that's also about the time the Cheng started calling on their family members to help them open additional stores outside of LA. They started in Houston and in Northern California, and it worked. Soon, they were opening a new Forever 21 store almost every six months. By 2001, Forever 21 had 122 stores, and it opened its first store outside of the US that year, in Canada. It had 370 by 2005, and seven of those were overseas. International growth really picked up from there. It entered China in 2012, Brazil came in 2014, by 2015, Forever 21 had 251 locations outside of the U.S., spanning 40 countries across five continents. This was also about the time that fast fashion was really heating up. Retailers were making clothes faster than ever, at affordable prices, all while offering mainstream consumers budget versions of runway looks. Shoppers worldwide weren't buying clothes like they used to, and companies weren't making them like they used to. Clothing production globally doubled from 2000 to 2014. The number of garments produced annually topped 100 billion for the first time in 2014, and the number of garments bought by the average shopper worldwide jumped by 60% from 2000 to 2014. Meanwhile, across most categories of apparel, shoppers by 2014 were keeping their clothes about half as long as they did at the turn of the 21st century. The ability to now capture on the runway on the runway within seconds. Take the picture, knock this off, duplicate it, okay? Go back to your design team, create it in a, in, in a, in a fabric that is reasonable, that, it, that we, we can afford to, to, to price it at X, launch it. And, and, and that's what happened, has happened. So the, so the entire uh, digital landscape has contributed uh, because of the ease of technology and the use of technology. As fast fashion retailers expanded their reach within the U.S., they took bites out of Forever 21's business. 
Forever 21 lost its share of the apparel and shoe market in the U.S. in 2016, as Zara and H&M slightly gained share. Where a company like Zara and H&M have been able to be successful is they create a foothold here and then the scale of the market creates that chimney flue effect where it really allows them to take off relatively quickly. And once they've established a foothold here, they've established the logistics, the merchandising capability and the, the labor management, they're able to very quickly start to add to that base of business without having to uh, recreate a lot of a lot of new infrastructure. As of 2018, H&M and Zara are the top two apparel and footwear retailers globally, while Forever 21 ranks 17th. Forever 21 ended 2018 with a 0.3% share of the clothing and footwear industry, while Japan's Uniqlo, which entered the U.S. in 2005, had 1.1%, Zara had 1.2%, and H&M had 1.6% share. But while these rivals found fans in the U.S., Forever 21 wasn't as warmly embraced outside of its home country. The Changs probably didn't realize back in 2015 that their business was about to go downhill, fast. At the time, Forever 21 had 43,000 employees and was doing $4.1 billion in sales globally in 2014. American Eagle, which Forever 21 calls a similarly inexpensive peer, did $3.28 billion that year. Urban Outfitters, another so-called peer, did $3.32 billion. That same year, the Changs were also crowned one of America's wealthiest couples, with a combined net worth reaching an estimated $5.9 billion. The couple had said it wanted to double its company sales by 2017 and open hundreds of new stores by then. But those dreams would never be realized. Forever 21's international business was in shambles. Its styles weren't resonating in markets where it failed to dig in and understand the kinds of clothes local consumers wanted. The sizing was off, too. And I think that's such a huge issue for all brands. When, when any brand, we've seen so many American brands, it's not just Forever 21, come overseas and just say, well, hey, you know, if it works at home, we'll just plunk it down and it'll work there, too. The consumer will come. And that's just the farthest thing from the truth in reality. The company also appeared not to do enough market research into the shopping habits of international consumers. A 2019 report from the New York Times cited employees who told the paper that Forever 21 sometimes didn't understand local labor laws. One worker told the Times that Forever 21 moved into Germany without realizing stores in the country were typically closed on Sundays. Employees also told the paper that Forever 21 made mistakes, like not recognizing that customers in some European countries shopped for winter merchandise earlier in the year than American consumers. Understanding the market in which you're putting the store is probably the biggest challenge that retailers overlook. The second one is just the complications of local rules and local legal constraints. You know, moving product in and out of countries is, is different, even if you're inside some of the, the free trading zones. And then lastly, the labor market in these, in these countries are also very different. In 2015, the company admitted the majority of the international stores were unprofitable because of high labor costs and the fact that its clothes weren't resonating with customers in Europe and Asia. It said sales back in the States were actually relatively strong, but its global operations were becoming a huge drag and a bigger burden than a blessing. Matters became worse when word of Forever 21's poor financial standing started to leak. Factory operators in China were pressuring the clothing retailer for money. Payments to subcontractors in stores were as much as 30 days late. Forever 21 declined to give comment to CNBC about each of these reports. Global sales would fall from $4.1 billion in 2014 to $3.1 billion in the 12 months into July 31, 2019. The company said its stores in Canada, Europe, and Asia have been losing roughly $10 million per month, on average, over the 12 months from September 2018 to September 2019. Big stores, both overseas and in the U.S., have become a burden for Forever 21. It used to be. The bigger the store, the more in awe customers would be when they walked in. Without the internet, retailers needed aisles of shelves, thousands of square feet, to be able to showcase all their merchandise. After the Great Recession rocked some American retailers in 2008 and 2009, Forever 21 said it jumped at the chance to scoop up vacant stores at cheaper prices. 
It bought locations from some of America's largest retailers. Forever 21 had by 2015 opened a 90,000 square foot store in Times Square in New York, a 94,000 square foot store in San Bernardino, California, and a 127,000 square foot store in Las Vegas, to name a few examples. The average H&M store is closer to just 20,000 square feet. Forever 21 set up shops overseas in prime retail destinations, like on London's Oxford Street. That store was closer to 30,000 square feet. In China, along Shanghai's East Nanjing Road, the city's bustling commercial district, Forever 21 had a roughly 75,000 square foot flagship shop. Now, e-commerce has changed the need for such great size and scale. Clothing is moving online, but Forever 21 admits, compared to its peers, Forever 21's online sales as a proportion of its overall sales are low. Forever 21 launched its website in 2005 and has said only about 16% of its total sales come from the web today. Analysts would argue the same. They've been focused on their stores and late to the online game. In 2017, only adding to its glut of real estate, Forever 21 launched a standalone beauty concept store called Riley Rose to rival Ulta and Sephora. But that could be written off as just another distraction. In bankruptcy proceedings, all standalone Riley Rose stores are set to close. Another issue has been the overall strain that such rapid real estate expansion put on Forever 21's supply chain. Bankruptcy documents say, the large format stores forced Forever 21 to create complicated assortment strategies and triggered inventory management challenges. It became more difficult for the company to get clothes quickly to stores, something known as speed to market. The company said its European and Asian stores undermined Forever 21's ability to nimbly bring inventory to market and, by extension, hurt its worldwide profitability while distracting the management team. Forever 21 admitted it ended up not buying enough inventory in 2017 and then bought too much in 2018. It would end up with duplicates of the same styles when it didn't need them. That led to another big problem. Forever 21 stores across the world felt too cluttered. When we go digital or physical, you, you know, the, the physical presence, when you go to, a, to a, a Forever 21, I don't know about you, but for practically every Forever 21, whether it's in Jakarta, whether it's in, in uh, Shanghai, or whether it's in New York, the stores look disheveled. Shoppers also increasingly started calling out Forever 21's clothing as cheap. And Zara's was seen as a higher end but still affordable option. The Changs finally fell from Forbes billionaire ranks in July of 2019, a final prelude to Forever 21 heading to bankruptcy court. The bankruptcy shows just how difficult it can be to go global. The failures often come when companies aren't prepared to invest in the local markets, to build out a local supply chain, and to understand what shoppers there are looking for. One bright spot has been Latin America, which Forever 21 says is its strongest outside of North America, with roughly 96% of its stores there generating positive cash contribution from September 2018 to September 2019. Analysts say Forever 21's clothing has resonated more in that market, from a style and price perspective. The Latin American market also has seen less of an influx of competitive fashion players compared with parts of Europe and Asia. You know, I think the question is not so much will Forever 21 survive bankruptcy. Uh, and you'll, they'll come out of it. They'll right-size their stores. But once you get in the Chapter 11, the customer to a certain degree already knows that. But do they really care? They care when they go into your store and it's not merchandise. I do think that, you know, they have a chance of going back into it again, like many chains have, like Payless and a number of other ones, because the customer can be very unforgiving. If you're not running a very good retail store, uh, the customer will just leave. Forever 21 has said in bankruptcy documents about its future, in an ever-shifting retail landscape that has seen dozens of casualties over the last several years, the traits that initially led to the success of Forever 21, collaboration, grit, and creativity, are the same traits that will propel Forever 21 through these Chapter 11 cases successfully. Forever 21 declined to participate in this video when asked by CNBC. Now, as it looks to right the ship, Forever 21 says it will try to refocus its product assortment streamline its supply chain, and grow sales online. It says it will try to get better at being trend right. It learned what didn't work in Asia and Europe, and it will try to apply those lessons as it fights to win back American shoppers.